Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome today to today's Lunch and Learn. Um, I'm Kara Cordell, and I'm the Marketing Manager for Live on Nebraska. We're so glad that you've taken an hour or maybe a little bit less to join us today to talk about another important facet of organ and tissue donation. Um, this one is really special to us because we get to talk to one of our own um, co-worker employ and employees, Emily Niebrugge. Emily Niebrugge. Um, we are sharing Emily's story today in um, celebration and in um, recognition of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, when Emily joined our team uh, a little over three years ago, she didn't have a personal connection to donation and transplantation. Um, Emily spends a lot of her time out in the public educating about the importance of organ and tissue donation, um, but it was shortly after she joined us that unfortunately she did um, end up having that personal connection when her dad, Drew, passed away unexpectedly from heart failure. So Emily, thank you so much for doing this today. Um, you know how awesome I think you are, but um, oh. it's exciting to be able to share your story with our team members, with our volunteers, and just members of the donation community who I know are gonna be really impact impacted by your story and um, how it's come full circle for you. So thank you again. Yeah, yeah of course, I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Um, first of all, would you just start by telling us about your dad? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. So my dad's name was Drew and he lived in Sioux City, Iowa. He was always the funniest guy in the room. He always had jokes. We had our own inside jokes and we just loved to laugh together. That was what we always loved being able to do together. Um, he was, uh, he loved to grill. He loved to smoke meat. He loved to have people over in the backyard. He loved to entertain people and play games like card games and board games and stuff like that. Um, and he loved sports. He loved football and baseball, go Seattle teams, the Mariners and the Seahawks. Um, so that was something that we always used to do together. That was one of the last things that we actually ever did together was watch the Seattle uh, Seahawks football game. So that was really cool. Um, and let's see, I was trying to think of some of my favorite memories with him before we jumped on today. And so, honestly, some of my favorite things to do with him were to sit down in his man cave in the basement and we would have these like music wars. So he would play a song and I would then play another song that it reminded me of. And we would go through all these genres. So we would start off with like rock and roll and we would go through like grunge and folk music and acapella songs. And like, we just could go back and forth for hours just sitting and laughing and playing music together. And so like, that's, that's just who he was as a person. He was an entertainer and he just loved helping people and being there for people too. Mm, that's amazing. He sounds like such a cool guy. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind sharing, um, Kind of what happened with your dad and then i also know that you had um a lot of conversations about him wanting to be a donor so i think um when he did pass away you knew exactly what to do would you just talk about that a little bit yeah absolutely so my dad um unfortunately passed away from congestive heart failure about three years ago um at the time that he started getting sick it with the doctors tried to do everything they could they did a triple bypass surgery and he just wasn't able to recover from it. And so it was just too late and we weren't able to save him. Um, but like you said, Kara, we had always talked about donation um, ever since I started working at Live On Nebraska. So um, he thought that my job was really, really cool. He was a nursing student at Mount Marty College in Yankton, South Dakota. And so he thought everything that was able to be recovered was really amazing. And the ways that the human body could help other people um, was really impressive and, and just really cool. And so, he would always ask me, you know, like what was going on? What are the new advances in technology? Things like that. Um, what I got to shadow at work and what I got to see um, and, and how donation just impacts other people and how it helps people. Um, and so we also talked about how passionate he was about donation. He was one of those people who always said, I can't use it when I'm gone. I want this. I want to be able to help as many people as possible after I'm after I pass away. And so that was actually one of the first things that we talked about when he did pass away. Um, I remember being in the hospital and talking to his girlfriend and we were like, what's next? And she said, well, he of course would wanna help you and help as many people as possible. So we knew that tissue donation uh, was, was absolutely something that we would wanna move forward with. And it was a really easy no brainer because we had had that conversation and we just knew how important it was to him. 
Uh, I, I think that was probably a huge gift to you to have that knowledge and just know that this is what he wanted to do. And um, this is what we're going to do moving forward. We hear that so many times from other donor families who've uh, made that decision to, and had that conversation with their loved ones. So I'm, I'm glad that you had that sort of um, sense of peace and, and certainty in that time. So, yeah. Um, what have you learned about his donation and how it's helped others? Okay, so this is really crazy that we're doing this today because it was exactly one year ago today that I got the letter from Iowa Donor Network um, telling me everything that was used and how his tissue graphs were able to help other people. So my dad was able to help 77 people through tissue donation and his um, graphs were able to help women recovering from mastectomies. He was able to help um, repair the stomach wall for somebody and his bones were able to help in dental repairs. And um, what is most, uh, not necessarily most important, but what touches my heart the most is um, that his corneas were able to help a 70 year old woman see again. I've actually been able to write with her and to learn a little bit more about her. And um, she, before her cornea transplant was kind of relegated to her room and she had to sit in the dark uh, because the light would hurt her eyes so much. And ever since her cornea transplant, she's been able to travel, to see her grandkids get married, to see her great grandchildren be born again. Um, and she just seemed like the sweetest person when I was able to write her and tell her about my dad and when she wrote me back. Um, and so those are some of the really amazing things that I've been able to learn about him. Obviously, it's really hard to miss my dad and, and I do miss him and it was a really difficult situation, but knowing that he's been able to help other people has really provided a lot of peace and hope uh, moving forward. And it offers a way to remember him and constantly honor his legacy. That's so amazing. And I think it's cool today that we're talking about tissue donation specifically, because a lot of times um, we see in the news people that get to hear their loved one's heartbeat, or we see a lot about kidney transplants and liver transplants, but we don't so much hear about tissue donation and corneal do donation. And it kind of just gave me chills to think about that woman, how how isolating her life was to sit yeah. in a room in the dark because you know of the pain that was caused by her her disease and then to be able to meet a grandchild like that is I, there's nothing better than that and so gosh what a feeling to know that your dad had a part in that and that I didn't realize that it's been a year since you got that letter to this day yeah. that's that's super cool um and I it just gave me a little bit of chills to to hear that and yeah. to um to hear how he's helped people that's that's so amazing so yeah he's literally given them life and I just think that that is really amazing. Yeah. And I think we, with, with those tissue donations, we don't think about what being able to walk again without pain means, or yeah. some of those things that, you know, aren't life saving, but in a lot of ways they are life saving because they give people back their life. They give them, you know, um, a life without pain. And, um, that means so much to people's quality of life and what they're able yeah. to do in terms of work and their time with their family and, and everything else. So it really is an incredible gift. And we talk about this all the time when we're out in the public, but I think, you know, people don't know that tissue donation, um, is very common, more so common than organ donation. And that, you know, one person could potentially help a hundred people. Your dad helped 77 people. Like that yeah. is incredible. Like I, I hope someday, you know, that I, I will be in that um, position to be able to help people that way. I think that's so incredible. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So transitioning a little bit to kind of the full circle moment and what we're here to talk about today. Um, I wanted to share a photo with the audience before we jump into this. So let's bring that up. Okay. So there's a photo of you. I don't know if the audience can tell what your shirt says, but it says um, pre-viver. And um, up until I went through this journey with you and um, what you've been going through, I'd never heard of that term before. I didn't know what it meant, um, but I think it's a really powerful term and especially in um, context of what you've done and the decisions you've made. So would you tell us a little bit about Previvor and how you came to find out that you in fact were one? Yeah, absolutely. It's It's been a journey for sure. Um, so 
a couple years ago, I went to my doctor for just a regular checkup. And at that appointment, she um, was looking through my family history and she immediately referred me to a, a breast center here in Omaha um, because my mom had breast cancer two times in her life. And they wanted to test me for what is called a BRCA gene mutation. And so with that gene mutation, it basically increases your risk of breast and ovarian cancer among a few other diseases and cancers. And for me, I have the BRCA1 gene mutation. The test came back positive and I kind of just knew that it was going to based on my family history. Um, and so with the BRCA1 gene mutation, my chances of breast cancer um, are 85% or more. And my chances of ovarian cancer are 50% or more. And so I made the decision um, to have a preventative bilateral mastectomy to reduce that number down to um, less than 3%. And so because I made that decision to have a preventative surgery, that's why we call ourselves pre-vivors because we're not survivors. We didn't go through cancer. We didn't go through chemo and radiation and, and all of those things that go along with it, but we beat cancer and we were able to, um, preventatively act before cancer um, was able to affect us. And so um, that's kind of where that term comes from. And that's why I consider myself a previvor now. Did you know about that term before you had gone through the testing? And Nope, I, I had never heard that before. And so um, I joined after I found out that I tested positive um, for this gene, my breast um, health, my breast health doctor was really great about providing me resources and like Facebook groups to join. And she actually told me about the term um, because she knew that I wanted to go forward with a preventative mastectomy. And she told me uh, there's this group in Omaha that call themselves Previvors um, and that I could join them on Facebook. And I joined a national group too, to um, just get as many resources and a sense of community to go through this as I was going through the journey. Um, so she was the one who introduced me to that term. I had never heard of it before. So that was something that I thought was really cool. I love it. It's such a powerful word. It has so much packed into it in terms of making those decisions and taking ownership of your own health. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, you talked a little bit about your family history, but would you go a little bit deeper into that, into that family history and how you, you know, you knew that there was a chance that you would be pre predisposed to breast cancer? Yeah, absolutely. So my grandfather on my mom's side had um, colon cancer and a great aunt had ovarian cancer and a cousin had breast cancer in addition to my mom having breast cancer twice. And so that's kind of how I knew I was like, there's something going on here. Like this has to be genetic. Like there's just too many instances um, of cancer in our family. And so um, I was actually my mom's caretaker for the second time that she had breast cancer. And so I was there taking care of her during her chemo treatments, uh, making sure that she was okay um, during her doctor appointments, getting her to those doctor appointments. Um, I was in college at the time and I remember working like three jobs to just help out in as much as many ways as I could. And that was really difficult watching her go through that and um, just seeing how um, how it affected her and everything that she had to go through. Um, and I just never wanted that to happen to me. I just decided that I would never go through that. And um, I wanted to be around for my loved ones and to do everything in my power not to go through that. And so that's why I decided to get genetic testing done. And that's why I decided to go through with my mastectomy because I wanted to take control of my own life and um, be the one who called the shots, not cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't imagine what that was like to go through that. Um, and I'm so happy that your mom came out on the other side of it. I know yeah. she fought so hard and um, that she's still with us today and, and doing well. That's that's amazing. But that's a very hard thing to have to go through. Yeah. And I I can only imagine being in your shoes, like you said, seeing that and knowing that that was that was not something you wanted for yourself. Um, so with that knowledge, you did decide to have a double mastectomy to have breast removal surgery preventatively. Um, what? I mean, what did your doctor talk to you about? What what did she tell you when with this option? What what were your options? And I mean, you talked a little bit about this, but can you expand a little bit more on on that decision? What your thoughts were about going into that that decision and making that um, ultimately to have the surgery? Yeah, absolutely. So before I got all this genetic testing done, 
I obviously knew that something was up, that I had a very increased risk of breast cancer because my mom had had it twice already. So I was honestly already thinking about a preventative mastectomy before I even knew that I tested positive for the BRCA1 gene mutation. Um, and so when I went in to meet with my doctor, um, she was very adamant about not telling me what to do. She, you know, she told me, she was like, this is your decision. This is, this is up to you. I could have done um, nothing as, in, uh, as, a, as far as a mastectomy surgery. I could have decided to not go through with that surgery and just do yearly or every six month screenings and just be very dil diligent about um, staying on top of my screenings and making sure that if something were to happen that we would catch it very early. So I could have done that. And um, I also could have done what I did, which was the preventative double mastectomy. Um, and so when she told me that my test came back positive, like I said, I had already been thinking about that beforehand. So it was the easiest decision that I had to make. Um, a lot of people have talked to me about my journey and my decision, and they say things like, you know, Emily, that must have been a really hard decision for you. And I tell them, no, it was the easiest decision to make because seeing my mom go through everything that she did and wanting to be here for the ones that I love. Um, it was absolutely the easiest decision that I ever made. And I made it right then and there in that moment when she told me that I tested positive for the BRCA1 gene mutation. And so with that, she referred me to a breast surgeon and a plastic surgeon uh, because I decided that I wanted reconstruction um, after my mastectomy, uh, which some women don't. Some women choose to not undergo reconstruction. And that's totally, you know, up to them, um, whatever they think that is right for their body. Um, but I did want reconstruction. So I was referred to the breast surgeon who did the tissue removal and the plastic surgeon um, who would place uh, my implants. I decided to go with saline implants um, to, to complete that re reconstructive process. Gotcha. Um, in, in our line of work, you know that many women who choose to have breast um, reconstruction following a mastectomy benefit from skin donations. Um, you mentioned earlier that your dad indeed did give um, skin grafts as part of his donation. So what did your doctor tell you about reconstruction options and how, you know, and did you discuss if donated skin grafts would be used or was that something you brought up just because you <laughs> knew that that was a possibility? Yeah. So, um, I actually brought it up before she even had a chance to get to that point because I just knew that with reconstruction, they would use what they call alloderm and the alloderm acts as a pocket to hold the implants. And so I asked her before she had a chance to get to that explanation, um, if she could keep all of that information set aside so that I could eventually write my donor family and tell them, thank you. And so, um, we did go over it and she just told me how it would, how it would be used and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, I kind of beat her to the punch because I knew, <laughs> I knew that it would be used in my reconstruction. Absolutely. Did you talk about other options um, in terms of reconstruction? I know there are some different options. Did you go over any of those different ones or were you just kind of, this is, this is what I want to do based on what you knew? Yeah, um, we didn't really talk about too many other options. Um, there was a surgeon who I was talking with previously who um, ended up leaving her practice. And so I had to be switched to a different surgeon. And that previous doctor that I talked with, we talked about fat grafting and doing some options with that. Um, but ultimately, I decided just to go with the implants over the muscle um, just because it was preventative. There was no risk of cancer at that time. And so I had some options to do things like over the muscle implants and things like that to um, just help in my recovery time. And, and it was a little less intensive to recover from. Um, so we pretty much just talked about that from the very beginning. I knew that I wanted implants. My mom um, had had implants and it was actually kind of nice being able to have somebody go through the same process and be able to talk to her and ask her opinion and just get help and feel like I wasn't alone in going through that process and making those decisions. Absolutely. Um, I think you, you shared with me a little bit about your doctor and being able to trust her through that. Would you just talk about like that relationship that you have with your doctor and, and what that's meant to you and being able to have that trust and what she was recommending to you? Yeah. So on some of the options that we were discussing when I went to my second surgeon, um, she kind of went over some of those options that I had, like fat grafting and things like that. And she 
made the comment. She was like, if you were my daughter, I would tell you absolutely not. And so the fact that she was treating me with so much care and like, I have goosebumps just thinking of how well she treated me and how seriously she took me and how much she valued me as a patient to be honest with me and to tell me what her recommendations were. I mean, that made me be able to trust her so much. And I literally put my life in her hands. <laughs> and like, I did so knowing that I could absolutely trust her and that we had a really good relationship and that she would absolutely take care of me um, to the best of her ability. That's awesome. Um, so now today you've had your mastectomy um, and you have already received some skin grafts as part of that, that surgery to kind of prep you for those implants. Um, you will get some more in the next phase of your surgery. Um, so just where you are today, how do you feel about the decisions that you've made to get you to this point? But then also knowing that, you know, you are a tissue recipient now and, um, um, you know, you, like I said, you've got some of those same graphs that your dad donated and, and you're just part of this whole circle of life. How does, how does that feel to you? Yeah, absolutely. So I am, first of all, very grateful. Um, I'm grateful for the community that surrounds me. I'm grateful for Live On Nebraska for being so supportive of um, everything that I've gone through. And especially you, Kara, you've been amazing too. Um, I am very grateful for my family who has helped me through this. Um, it, it was an easy decision, but it wasn't easy to go through. And so um, I had a lot of people there to help me and take care of me and to make sure that I stayed strong and brave throughout the entire process. And so that's been really great. Um, and then just to know that I'm a tissue recipient, um, I was thinking about this a lot, like what does this mean to me? And I keep going back to something that Kara Elliott, who we have featured before for Breast Cancer Awareness Month, she's a this tissue recipient of the same grafts as me. Um, I keep going back to something that she said when we were interviewing her one time and she said, um, this donor is now a part of me. And that is, um, it's very symbolic for me. And I'm very thankful that they have literally um, given me life through um, the passing of their own. And um, to know that they are truly a hero um, and that I've been able to live on and keep um, living life on my terms because of their sacrifice is something that I don't take lightly and that I'm very, very grateful for. Um, and then just to bring it full circle, knowing that my dad was able to give these same tissue graphs, um, it, it really just emphasizes how much life he was able to give. When I first read that he um, was able to help with mastectomy surgeries, of course, I thought that was important. I thought that was great. But now going through it and being the recipient of those same graphs that he was able to give, um, it really does make me so proud to be his daughter because I know exactly the kind of life that he was able to give somebody and the opportunities that he was able to allow somebody to have. And I honestly don't think that there's any better way to leave that kind of a legacy in this world. And I am so honored that I get to keep talking about him and his gifts three years later and continually in the future and everything that he was able to do as a person and the legacy that he was able to leave behind. So it's all just, it's so very special to me. That's amazing. Um, I think something that we haven't touched on and it's, um, it's really interesting to go out into the public. I think when people think about donations, sometimes some of the reasons that we hear about people not donating is that they feel like um, they're too old to donate. Mm. And um, I know you get to talk about this um, when you go out and do your public education. But for those that maybe haven't heard one of our presentations or, or don't know this, um, there is no age limit in terms of registering as a donor, um, you know, uh, what's really exciting and interesting to be able to share is when we're out, our oldest donor here at Live on Nebraska was over 100 years old. Um, and, and that happens, you know, somewhat regularly. And so that's incredible to think at that age, somebody is making um, that much of an impact on somebody else. But often those those older donors are giving um, skin grafts. And so they're helping people like you who are recovering after breast cancer surgery. Um, they're helping people with burns. 
And so a lot of our older donors, that is the impact they're making out in the world. And it's so cool for me to, to see someone I know and someone I care about so closely being impacted by that. Um, but, you know, that's just something if you're watching and you, you don't know this, like share that with the people that you are around because, you know, you can still make a difference. Even as we get older, um, you can do so much good by being a, you know, a registered organ and tissue donor and the impact that it's made in Emily's lives. And, you know, we, we met J Jason Schechterly several years ago, who was a police officer who was burned after an ex accident and he survived because of skin grafts. Um, we get to hear these amazing stories being in the field, but, um, I just think it's so cool that those older donors are making a difference through tissue donation in, in ways like that. And so I think you can elaborate on this if you want to, but like out there talking about that and, and having the ability to educate on that, what does that mean to you? Uh, that's amazing. And now I actually get to share my story too, when I go out and I do this education and I think hearing personal stories and hearing ways that people have personally impacted other people is so important. And I think it just puts a face to this cause that we are so passionate about. And that's been so amazing. Um, and yeah, I don't know who my donor was, but just thinking that it could have been anybody from any walks of life um, is pretty amazing. And the fact they're, they're just a hero to me and to be able to talk about our donor heroes and share with people in the community who they are and show their picture and tell them a little bit about them, I think is um, truly a blessing and it's an honor and a privilege to be able to share their story with people out in the community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we're nearing the end of our time here. And I didn't mention earlier that if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook with us today, you can um, type comments directly into um, that platform and we can we would love to answer them for you so if you have a question for Emily or I or anybody um, let us know and we would be happy to answer those for you I do see what we have one from Amber hi Amber um, Amber is a kidney recipient and we love to hear her story she she's asking do skin graft recipients have to take anti-rejection medications like other transplant patients um, I'm not an expert on this subject but I will tell you the answer is no to that so with tissue donations um, um, the cells that would identify them to an individual are removed. And so there is nothing that would cause rejection with those. So they do not have to have um, anti-rejection meds um, like an organ donor would. So that's a fantastic question. Um, Emily, are there other questions? I'm going to put you on the spot here, but are there questions that when you're out in the public that you get about tissue donation? Um, that you can think of that might help our audience today? Hmm, that is a great question. <laughs> You're like, thanks um, a lot, Karen. <laughs> I think one of the misconceptions is um, with cornea donation. I think mm -hmm. some people think like um, the whole eye is taken and generally it's just the front cover of the eye. It looks like a contact lens when it's recovered. Um, and so that's uh, just the cornea that is, is removed and used as uh, grafts for other people. Um, so that's something that I can think about. Um, I think one time I was out in the public and I had a middle schooler who was talking about his mom who was able to get a vein transplant. Um, I didn't really know a whole lot about vein transplants, to be honest. I knew that they could be used in like heart surgeries and to restore circulation, for example. But this kid told us this story when we were out doing education um, in Bellevue. And he said, my mom was actually able to get a vein transplant and she was able to walk again after her vein transplant. And so hearing firsthand how his mom was affected, I mean, she couldn't walk before her transplant. And so mm -hmm. you talk about giving life to people and giving them back um, a quality of life that they didn't have before. This kid was able to walk with his mom now. Like that is so amazing to me. And so um, that was a really big eye opener, just hearing his story and his connection to transplantation as well. Yeah. So, okay, I have just one more question for you. Having gone through um, your journey with, you know, breast cancer and prevention, what were the resources that were helpful to you? What, you know, what did you kind of come to rely on in terms of looking for advice and just getting through that that process. You mentioned your family and everyone, but was there were there resources um, that you really came to trust as you were making decisions? 
Absolutely. So the Hereditary Cancer Foundation here in Omaha was a really big resource for me. Um, it was founded by Brandy Preston, whose mom passed away from breast cancer, and she was tested and she tested positive for the BRCA1 gene mutation as well. Um, and so that foundation was very, very helpful. Um, my breast uh, doctor told me that if insurance did not cover my genetic testing that she would make sure that it got covered because of that foundation uh, and so that was really reassuring to me luckily you know our insurance did cover um, that test for me and so i didn't personally have to worry about that but just knowing that that resource is available for other people um, is a really great resource to have as well and they also have a facebook page for um, BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene um, people who carry those mutations. And so I was able to join that Facebook group and I was able to join um, an international Facebook group for BRCA1 and 2 gene mutations as well. And just seeing other people who had gone through the same thing and had to make the same decisions as me was very helpful. And it made me feel like I was a part of a community and that you know if I ever had any questions or concerns or I just needed somebody to talk to, um, I could do that. And I, I did end up being connected with one person um, in particular, who we've been able to go out for coffee, and she has become a really great friend to have and just a really great person to bounce off our same experiences with. And so those resources were really, really helpful in in just knowing that I had support to go through this journey. Yep. Oh, Amber has another question for us. Um, have you tried to reach out to your donor family? Uh, do you hope to hear from them one day? I reached out to my donor family, but I have not heard back. Um, understandably, I'm sure it resurfaces a lot of emotions on their part. So maybe you can talk about, you know, what kind of went through your head communicating with your dad's recipient. Yeah. Um, but then also kind of what your plan is for reaching out to your donor family. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I'm being totally honest. It took me a really long time to be able to muster up the courage to contact my dad's cornea recipient. It was something like Amber alluded to that it just resurfaced a lot of things and it took me a really long time to heal and to be okay um, with the passing of my dad. And hearing stories like Jason Schechterly's were really powerful in being able to go through that healing process. Um, and so it took me probably two years before I was ready to reach out to her and you know, I've heard a lot of recipients say that they feel guilty um, receiving those organs because somebody had to pass away in order to make that life possible for them. And so, you know, I don't know if my dad's recipient felt guilty at all, but I was the one who reached out first to her. And hopefully that gave her some sense of peace, um, knowing that I was the one who was interested in communicating with her. Um, and she wrote me back and it was really beautiful. And I just really treasure that experience. And so I'm glad that I did it, but it definitely took me a while to be able to be ready. Um, with this round um, coming full circle, I actually have a doctor appointment today um, and I'm gonna ask her if she can get me the contact information to be able to write my donor family. So I definitely want to, um, and I understand if they don't respond back. Um, I know what they're going through and I know that it's a really difficult journey sometimes. And so I just wanna be able to say thank you and tell them how much of a hero their loved one was. And if that's the end of it, then that's okay. And hopefully they just know that and it brings them some peace. Um, but I'm, I'm definitely really excited to be able to write them and to say thank you. So I hope that everything comes together uh, and that I'm able to do that. That sounds amazing. Well, I think that was our last question. So Emily, thank you again. You made me tear up a couple of times in this conversation. Um, and I've heard your story lots of times. So it doesn't stop getting um, less powerful or emotional as we talk about it more. So, um, you know, you know, I think you're so strong and brave and all the women out there who are facing breast cancer, no matter what decisions they're making, um, we're just happy to be able to be a part, a possible part of their journey and knowing that our donor heroes have, have, have played such an important part in, you know, restoring life to so many people like you is, is really um, gratifying and wonderful to be a part of. So thank you for everyone for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you on another Lunch and Learn. Have a great afternoon.